Our reading today comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On the evening of that day, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake. So they went, so they sent the crowd home and took him with them in the small boat in which he had been sitting, accompanied by other small craft. Then came a violent squall of wind, which drove the waves aboard the boat until it was almost swamped. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They awoke him with the words, Master, don't you care that we're drowning? And he woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Hush now, be still. The wind dropped, and there was a dead calm. Why are you so frightened? Do you not trust me even yet? He asked them. But sheer awe swept over them, and they kept saying to each other, Whoever can he be? Even the wind and the waves do what he tells them. The word of God for the people of God. Pray with me. Come, come, O Holy Spirit. Come into this space and fill us up with your power, your trust, and your truth. Amen. It's very hard for us 21st century folks to deal with the notion of miracles. Yet the Bible is full of them. And in this story, we have actually two miracles, the surface miracle and the deeper miracle. On the surface is the story of Jesus calming the storm. Impossible, we think, yet here it is. Did it really happen? That's a question that never bothered the writers of the gospel and for them, and I get this quote from the Reverend Dr. Larry Stuckey, for them, truth with a capital T was not about factual accuracy. It didn't matter if a specific event actually happened in a specific way. What mattered was the truth shown in the story of the event. So we don't have to spend a lot of time discussing whether this calming of the storm really happened, because there's much more to the story than that. And one purpose of this particular story is to show Jesus calm in the face of a violent storm, which contrasts with his disciples' fear of that same storm. Now, I was a sailor until about three years ago, and I have been out in storms, and I will tell you, it's really scary. It's really scary. The forces of nature, of wind and wave, you really cannot believe how strong they are. They're downright scary in their power, especially when you're out in the boat, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of a storm. It's a real possibility that the boat will capsize and they will be thrown into the chaos of the water. And that has happened to me. I think when I capsized, my happiest moment was, well, I don't have to be afraid of capsizing. It has already happened. Now I have to stay alive. Or the, the fear that the boat will be blown onto the rocks and sink and I have missed that by a hair's breadth. And it's a very scary feeling. The disciples, I think, were very human in their fear of this storm. And where is Jesus? He's asleep. He's asleep in the back of the boat. And the terrified disciples wake him up and say, don't you care that we are dying? And Jesus shocks them. And in a slightly different phrasing of his words, he says, why are you afraid? 
Have you still no faith? Have you still no faith? Or don't you have any faith yet? By this time, Jesus' followers knew he had the power to heal, and he, they knew he could cast out demons, and they knew he could perform miracles. But could he really save them from the storm? Of course they were frightened, but then they were amazed. He calmed the storm. The wind went away, the waves went away, and there was a dead calm, smooth, glassy sea. And then he confuses them by saying, why are you afraid? Don't you believe yet? And this leads to the second critical part of this story, the other miracle, the second layer of meaning, which is even more important than the surface story of calming the storm. For the people of Israel, water was the domain of demons, and the sea in particular was under the sway of the powerful forces of evil. Genesis begins with chaos, and God births creation with God's wind, God's spirit, God's breath sweeping over the roiling waters of the deep. The disciples were rightly afraid of the storm, but they also believed that they were face to face with the utmost power of evil in this world. Evil in the form of these massive waves, wild seas, intensive winds. Evil was about to destroy them. And Jesus, on whom they had staked their very lives, was asleep in the back of the boat, seemingly oblivious to the chaos all around them. Why are you afraid? Don't you believe yet? I think that Jesus was not really talking about their fear of the storm, but of their fear that even Jesus could not overcome the world's evil, evil that was embodied in this terrible, terrible storm, the one that Jesus had just calmed. The disciples knew he had power over demons, demons being the personification of evil, but to have total power over the ultimate manifestation of evil, a storm at sea, that's a different magnitude of power altogether. And they had never experienced such power. Why are you afraid? Don't you believe yet? I don't know about you, but I have a really hard time watching or reading the news these days. Anybody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The evil in the world is overwhelming. The divisions among us, hate speech, racism, sexism, and all the other isms out there. Homophobia, Islamophobia, and all of the other phobias, and just plain meanness. An inexcusable attack on Israel leads to an inexcusable slaughter and starvation in Palestine. Murders in our country and in our community are so ordinary, so common, that they are small stories on page three of the metro section. A few years ago, you may remember this, that we were shocked when a member of Congress called the president a liar during the State of the Union address. You may remember that. Now it happens every day, and nobody notices. We know that people do evil things, mean things, awful things. The evidence is all around us. The question is not whether evil things happen. The question is this. Is evil the horrible actions of people, or is it more than that? Is it a spiritual force that exists outside of human action? In other words, does evil exist separate from the way we act it out? It's not an easy question to answer, 
But the biblical account is clear. Jesus is clear. Paul is clear. The church through the ages is clear. Evil is a real entity, just as God is a real entity. Evil is a powerful force that causes humans to do terrible things. And the question for us is less, for us is less the question of Jesus calming the storm than it is of Jesus overcoming evil. Because if Jesus can overcome evil, then why is there still so much evil in the world? You know, I get asked that question a lot, as if going to seminary gives me the answer to that. I don't have an answer to that. But the answer that I live with is that God continues to give us free will, free choice. And with this choice, we can call on Jesus in the boat, as the disciples did, saying, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Or my question would be, God, don't you care that I'm dying here, trying to fight off the power of evil all around me? And Jesus, who calms the storm, can and will deliver us from the evil within us. Doesn't destroy it, doesn't get rid of it, but removes its power from our lives. Now, most of us probably do not think of ourselves as evil. Maybe we're not perfect, but and sometimes we do bad things, especially when you're driving in traffic around here. No, nobody would do that. Uh, because we are generally good people. But the power of evil is very real. The temptation is really, is real. And sometimes it's just too easy to go along with the status quo that doesn't harm me and look away from the reality, whatever it is, that harms others, especially others who are not like me. You know, how much do we recognize that in some ways by our inaction, we participate in evil deeds of this, con in the, of this country, in this world, in our community. But we have friend, we have help. We are powerless over the force of evil, but Jesus is not. And Jesus gives us the power to resist that power, not saving us from the acts of evil committed against us. Nowhere does the Bible promise that level of safety. No, Jesus offers us the ability to resist the power of evil that is trying to get into us, that is trying to consume us, that is trying to take over as first place in our lives. In the United Methodist Church, when we are baptized or when we join the church, we are asked several questions, and you can find them in the hymnal on page 33 if you want to look at it. But I want you to hear these two questions. Number one, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And the second question, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? This last question came, in, came out on a t-shirt after the 2016 General Conference in which the homophobic language was not removed from our book of discipline. And we can rejoice after this most recent general conference that that language has been removed. And the, the freedom and power to resist evil injustice and oppression has now been codified in our rule book. Now the question for me, and probably for you, is 
do we really believe in miracles? Do we really believe in miracles? And I don't think of, I don't mean those kind of things we talk about like when there's been a tornado and it missed your house and you call it a miracle. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the miracle that God can enable you, God can enable me to resist the forces of evil. And do you, do I, accept the power that God has already given us to resist evil in all its manifold expressions? I had dropped this next story from my sermon, but I'm gonna tell it to you now anyway, because it has finally happened for me. Many years ago, more than 50, the family of my best friend was murdered by a guy we knew. We had gone to high school with him and he broke into the house at night and murdered three people. He tried to murder my friend's mother, but she was only wounded. My friend escaped through a window and the other person in the house hid in a closet and he didn't find her. He was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. This was an act of sheer evil. But the question I have had to struggle with in those 50 years is would I let this act of evil rule, rule my life? Would I hold hatred against him for the rest of my life? It doesn't undo the evil that he did but I realized just very recently that I had given up that hatred. I'd given up his power over me, a power of evil. And I can only say thanks be to God for doing that because I couldn't do it. It was too strong a power in my life. And friends, I give thanks to God that I was able to trust God long enough strong enough to let go. So my question to you is this, do you trust God enough to prevent the power of evil work in, working in you? Can you say, God, help me stand firm against this? And I would like to invite you to join me in the invitation of trust, which you will find in your bulletin. And you will respond with the parts in bold. <clears throat> when dangers invade our sense of safety and we wonder if our Redeemer cares, we hear the invitation. When we face job loss or financial stress and our sense of security is shaky, we hear the invitation. When controversial issues or rigidity of thought and spirit threaten to tear at the very fabric of our nation, our community, our families, and the church itself, we hear the invitation. When our lives feel chaotic and desolate because of illness or sorrow, we hear the invitation. Help us to know, O oh God, that the one who calmed the dangerous sea is present with us, cares for us, and can calm the stormy waters of our lives. Help us to trust more fully and more deeply in you. We pray in the name of Jesus, who invites us to be at peace. Amen. Don't forget, we have coffee hour down the hall, and we'd love for all of you to come and chat. And don't forget, there's a concert here at 3 o'clock. All right? And you're going to be here, right? In the, in, the, in the words of the 60s, be there or be square. Beloved, go out in peace, trusting even when you cannot see or understand. 
May God, our guardian, protect you. Christ, our healer, restore you. And the Holy Spirit sustain you now and always. And all of God's people said with one voice, amen. NBUMC Weekly is a production of North Bethesda United Methodist Church, located in Bethesda, Maryland. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook at North Bethesda UMC or on Instagram at Loving All Neighbors. All music is licensed via Christian Copyright Licensing International, CCLI. <laughs>